Hello, my name is Sandra Larson. I work at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, in a research group called Ethnography and Evaluation Research. My research unit has studied inquiry-based learning in mathematics, college mathematics, for a number of years now. And my goal today is to share an overview of some of our findings with you. Uh, perhaps you are starting a workshop on inquiry-based learning or IBL. Uh, if so, welcome. Perhaps you are, uh, have been around this community longer already. Uh, in either case, I'm glad to share this um, broad overview with you. So first, I want to set our work into a broad context of the literature. I'll be talking about our work, about a particular study, but I want to point out that we actually know quite a bit about how people learn. Uh, we know uh, that learning is an active and constructive process of building new knowledge into our mental uh, landscape. We know that people learn in and with other people in social environments. We know that thinking about our own thinking is itself a practice that improves learning called metacognition. And we know that um, our beliefs about our learning and our own intelligence shape how much we can learn, how well we can learn, how uh, open we are to learning uh, in research on mindsets. I'll also point out that we know a lot about particulars of STEM uh, learning more broadly. Uh, for instance, there are books written about how people learn. Uh, these are a few of my favorites that you may want to check out. Uh, there are uh, um, meta-analyses and review articles um, that summarize evidence across a large number of studies in undergraduate science, math, engineering. There are studies of how uh, these kinds of active learning um, processes relate to students' retention of ideas. Um, after the course, their persistence in the major, and their success in university study more broadly. So uh, the kinds of things I'll be talking, the things I'll be talking about today are very well backed up by a broader body of literature. Uh, it's not just our study, but a large amount of work that has been done over many years. Uh, the work I, I have led and my colleagues have um, done is a study of inquiry-based learning in college mathematics at four universities that had IBL centers. Um, in the process of this, we got to study about 30 IBL courses ranging from first year to senior year. Uh, we focused on three broad research questions. What do students learn from their IBL classes? What is it they're experiencing in those classes that might help explain what they learn or don't learn? And how do instructors design and teach those courses? And we used a wide range of measures because the courses were variable, we had to use measures that were, that were broad, that could be applied across different kinds of courses. So surveys, interviews, academic records, classroom observations, um, studies of syllabi, and so on. I want to point out that when we study education as it's practiced in the real world, in colleges and universities, uh, we use a lot of different methods because each of them gives us a particular piece of the picture, but none of them give us the full, full picture. So just like wildlife biologists, we might look at scat and tracks and markings on the ground. We might set up cameras to capture behavior that we can't observe directly. Uh, and together, these uh, multiple measurements give us a picture of the organism in its wild habitat. In our case, that is students and instructors. So on to the results. What do students experience in IBL classes? Uh, we found across the courses that were um, described as IBL by the instructors and institutions, uh, three strong features of curriculum and three strong features of the pedagogy. The curricular features are that the courses were driven by a carefully built sequence or scaffolded set of problems or proofs uh, rather than a standard textbook. The pace of the course was set by a student's progress through this sequence of problems um, and varied throughout the term. Course goals tended to emphasize thinking skills, communication, and group work. Um, there were certainly content coverage goals, but they were less central to uh, the syllabus than in, in the comparison group of courses. Uh, from the point of view of pedagogy, we saw that students' uh, central behavior and central activity was solving challenging problems, working alone or in groups or some of both, they shared their solutions, analyzed, critiqued, and refined their solutions, and class time was used for those activities. That meant that students were playing a leadership role, uh, they were at the board, they were talking, um, and the activities of the course changed often. If we watched an hour, we did not see one hour of a single activity. 
The other implication of this was that the instructor's role was very different. They, they served as the guide on the side rather than the state, sage on the stage. They managed and monitored the classroom work, they summarized big ideas, pointed to the next ideas that were coming, um, and were a cheerleader for the students. What we um, also documented um, just how class time was used. Uh, and what you'll see in these graphs is that the courses in the set we the, labeled IBL had about 60% of student-centered activity um, in all the class time we observed, hundreds of hours. Um, so that included students at the board presenting work, uh, group work, small group work, and whole class discussion, whereas the non-IBL courses were largely lecture-centered um, and that instructors were talking most of the time. Uh, the lectures here are prepared talking and explanations are short, um, more spontaneous kinds of talk. But you can see that the way class time was used was very different. So on to the results of what students learn from these um, courses. What we found were, I'm going to highlight three important findings today. IBL instruction has positive outcomes for students on average, um, but also uh, positive outcomes for particular subgroups of students, especially women and students with lower initial math achievement. Let me start by uh, just mentioning the surveys. I said earlier that when we study a wide range of courses, um, freshman to senior, we need general outcome measures. And so I'll be talking here about survey results. We have a learning gains survey, which is given at the end of a course, where students tell us how much they learned on several different specific items. We've categorized those learning gains into cognitive uh, gains, having to do with math thinking and understanding, problem solving skills. Affective gains, which have to do with confidence, persistence, interest, um, sort of the emotional experience, and collaborative gains, working with others. Um, and what you can see is we have large, robust samples, hundreds of students who responded to these surveys um, in both the IBL and the non-IBL groups. And we've separated the IBL groups into what we call math track, which are STEM or math major students, or courses intended for those students, and the pre-service teachers who are preparing to become elementary or secondary math teachers. Uh, the attitudes and beliefs surveys are administered differently. They're given both before and after the term, so we can look at change in attitudes and beliefs. And again, those have speak to interest, confidence, and beliefs about learning. And again, hundreds of students in our samples uh, with matched pre-post surveys. So here is a graph showing the learning gains um, from the survey comparing IBL in the purple and non-IBL in the blue, and you see that IBL students, or students in IBL classes, report higher gains across all of our gains measures, um, cognitive and affective and collaborative. Um, and without going into detail, further detail, I'll summarize the results we have across many pieces of the study, uh, that these uh, learning gains are higher on average, that interviews corroborate the gains that students told us about on surveys so they could describe and detail these gains and explain them and explain where they got them. Uh, we also looked at students' grades in the courses after the IBL course or the non-IBL um, matched course. Um, and we, we found that their grades were as good or better than their peers. Um, so no harm was done. IBL's uh, students' attitudes and beliefs were somewhat more supportive of learning um, the kinds of attitudes you'd like to develop compared to non-IBL students. I'll say more about attitudes in a moment. So the findings all point the same direction, that IBL is, in general, good for students. When we break out the learning gains by gender, um, and we're also controlling here for differences in their incoming beliefs, uh, we see a very interesting finding that we didn't expect. If you take the pale colors uh, for the non-IBL course, uh, men and women, what you see is that there is a difference, a statistically significant difference um, in that men report higher gains in general. But when you look at the IBL students, not only are the bar bars taller, the gains are stronger, but the difference between men and women goes away uh, for both cognitive and affective gains. And uh, women report especially strong collaborative gains. So what you see here is that in the non-IBL lecture-based course, there is a gap in how students perceive their mastery of uh, learning and understanding and skills there's a gap in their interest and persistence, uh, which goes away in the IBL class. The attitudes behave similarly. What you see here is a graph showing the attitude difference um, 
between before and after the course or at the beginning and end of the course. So here, um, downward pointing negative bars are uh, worsening attitudes, attitudes that decreased, and upward pointing bars are improving attitudes. What you see here is one, it's hard to improve students' attitudes. They have many years of experience of learning math before they come to your class. And so um, it's hard to change attitudes. They don't change very much. But we do see um, in the traditional um, non-ideal courses that there was a strong gender gap in these gains and that women were more discouraged, um, less encouraged to take more math, less confident in their abilities. And again, that gap um, goes away or is lessened in IDL courses. And that's a good, strong finding. Uh, here's another way of expressing that data. If we take the three kinds of gains here, this slide is reporting effect sizes. That's a way of standardizing the differences so that it doesn't depend on the particular measure or the sample size. So these can be thought of as standard deviations of difference um, between the IDL and non-IDL courses or between men and women. And what you see is that the effect sizes are positive and um, modest, not large in size, but, but um, definitely positive for IBL courses across um, the types of gains independent of student gender. But that gender, uh, being a man, is a small advantage in taking a math class. Uh, what becomes very striking is when you put those two features together and you look at the effect sizes of the combination of gender and IBL or non-IBL course. Being a man in a non-IBL lecture-based course is a distinct advantage, nearly half a standard deviation um, or an effect size of nearly a half. Um, whereas in the IBL courses, you see that the, the effect size diminishes um, is no longer um, notable. So that's an important change. We like to talk about this as leveling the playing field. The non-IBO courses show a gender gap in self-reported learning gains and in mathematical beliefs and attitudes that largely disappears in the IBL classes. And so what that tells us is that um, IBL is fixing a course that is problematic. It's not fixing women, it's fixing a course that is um, not helping women's success. Uh, we also see that women do know worse by grades in the course, so that also tells us they're doing fine, but they're not having a positive experience that encourages them to go on, and they don't feel they have a sense of mastery from that learning experience. So IBL levels the playing field. Uh, again, to embed our work, our finding, uh, there are certainly other reports uh, where inquiry-based courses um, support more equitable learning. Some of the ones we've had for uh, several years now come from Joe Bowler's work um, and showing how these approaches can improve uh, achievement but also improve classroom interactions and attitudes. Um, an exciting meta-analysis that came out earlier in 2020 shows that this is in fact a very general pattern and looking across STEM fields and looking at underrepresented groups um, on many studies. And so that study is in the Proceedings of the National Academy and it's worth having a look. It's a meta-analysis looking at many studies. So in general, our work aligns well with prior work. I say that, however, um, to give you a caveat, which is that there is also work um, coming out that is suggesting that inquiry instruction can offer negative experiences for women. We don't have the numbers to do those same kinds of studies uh, on students of color, but we imagine some of the same effects could take place. And so, for example, Estrella Johnson and colleagues um, have work coming out that uh, documents an, a negative gender effect in an inquiry course. Uh, Ernest, Reinhold, and Shaw have work coming out that shows that um, there are negative gendered and sexist interactions in their classrooms, in small groups, um, and in side conversations that um, may explain uh, women's negative experiences in a free-for-all inquiry setting. Um, and work from physics, um, which also came out recently, saying that gender division of roles can happen if faculty are not paying attention. Deborah Ball uh, makes a good summary of these findings, saying that classrooms that are rich in discourse and discussion are crucial for empowering young people. And indeed, we see that with IBL courses. But they are also high risk for reproducing patterns of racism and marginalization. In other words, um, the, the patterns of sexism, racism, marginalization that are present in our broader society come to the classroom 
with us, with our students. And so we need to be careful to structure inquiry-based work to not allow those patterns to be reproduced in our classrooms. Uh, I will summarize also uh, some work about achievement. So again, using general measures here, grades, um, this image is to show you that, that we study grades um, downstream of the IBL um, or comparison course. So students diverge into two different courses, have the experience of an IBL or non-IBL course. We measure the grades after they come back together um, so that it's a fair comparison. They're taking the same course. Otherwise, the IBL courses often offer different kinds of assessments. And so one of the questions we're interested in here is can we tell the difference between students who had an IBL experience before or later on? And what we see is that in general, we can't tell the difference. In other words, no harm is done. Often IBL instructors tell us they cover a bit less material because they're going deeper. Um, and what we see here is that does not harm students in later courses, they're not missing anything. In general, what you see here, this is a graph of changes in grade, um, math course average before and after an IBL course, um, bucketing or bundling different groups of courses just to see if there were a pattern in what kinds of courses. And what you see is most of the bars are um, modestly negative, meaning courses get harder, grades go down a little bit as students progress into the major. Um, that's not a surprise, that happens for everyone, including for strong students. What is more of a surprise is the very tall upward pointing orange bars, which is that students who come into an IBL course with a lower mathematics GPA um, tend to get better grades later on. And that's very interesting. That doesn't happen for their lower achieving peers in non-IBL courses, and it doesn't happen for their high achieving peers in either kind of course in general. Um, and so we think what's going on there is that students are learning habits of learning, habits of working, habits of discourse that are helpful to them later on, and then improve their mathematics performance because they have transferable skills. It's very exciting to us. We haven't had a chance to follow that up, but it's a very intriguing finding. So let me summarize this and other um, findings from our work that I, I haven't given you in detail. Uh, IBL students who are initially lower achieving earn better grades after an IBL course, even though grades do not improve um, for others. They report higher learning gains on the surveys compared with high achievers, compared with their non-IBL peers. Um, this is especially true for the pre-service teachers. Uh, high achievers who take an IBL course early in their undergraduate years take more math later on than non-IBL peers. So the high achievers uh, don't necessarily get better grades, but they do persist more. It's more fun. It's more interesting. They told us about that in interviews. And finally, there's no harm done to them as far as their performance um, and outcomes. So again, IBL seems to give a boost to a particular set of students who have been underserved in many courses, and it doesn't harm the other students. How does all this happen? Uh, we have identified what we call the twin pillars of student learning in IBL classes. Deep engagement in mathematical ideas, that has to do with instructor's choice of meaningful, challenging, interesting problems, not too many, uh, and that make it worth students investing in what they call fruitful struggle. They are accountable to each other, they're ready to contribute in class. Then in class, they work with peers to make sense of those ideas. Um, this can be structured small group work, it can be whole class discussion, um, but it's important for them to explain, critique, defend, refine their ideas. They also report other benefits from that kind of collaboration. They talk about developing better communication skills, they like the positive out atmosphere of the classroom, and they've learned that math is not just done one way only. They see peers solve problems in ways they hadn't thought of. So these two things connect because individual preparation Deep engagement is reinforced by that peer-to-peer -peer collaboration in class, and that strengthens everyone's individual understanding as we talk and, and teach each other about these ideas. So what we find with instructors is that if they are working to support those twin pillars of student learning, um, that this is a way of becoming more effective as a teacher. First, instructors need to change what they do in class, how they spend class time, to move toward more student active approaches that enhance student learning. Secondly, they can keep getting better at this. As they refine their practice of IBL, it shapes, strengthens these key student learning outcomes. So a little bit of IBL is good, getting better at it is better. Finally, uh, Chris Rasmussen and I worked together to identify two more pillars 
of IBL. So these are pillars of the instructor behaviors. Um, the students need the opportunities for engaging in rich mathematical tasks and working together to process them. What instructors need to do to make the most of those student opportunities is inquire into student thinking and use that thinking to drive class forward, draw students' ideas out and make use of them in building understanding and sense making. And they need to make design and facilitation choices that foster an equitable environment. They need to be sure that everyone has a chance to learn. And the recent literature I mentioned shows just how important that kind of structure is. So four pillars of IBL, teaching and learning. Let me summarize by saying uh, that we do see students that learn from IBL. The evidence is consistent, it's robust, despite a, a great range of variation in the kinds of IBL courses we saw. There are lots of ways to success here. We find that women and lower achieving students benefit in particular with no harm done to others. We find that the active pedagogies that we observed in IBL classrooms explain student learning, particularly through the twin pillars and the instructor behaviors um, that make up the four pillars together. And finally, IBL teacher practice is a continuum. If you can design and adapt the two student pillars for your own teaching context, and you pursue the instructor pillars of inquiry into student thinking and fostering equity, um, these methods become even more effective than they will seem on your initial attempts. All of these findings are squarely centered in prior research and consistent with it. It's, it's important that you understand that this, this study um, is, is directly relevant to you, but it is by no means the only information that supports um, your choice to pursue IBL methods. I'll leave you with some further reading. Uh, our group has published much of this work. There's a link that you can follow to check out the papers. I'm suggesting a couple of starting points for you. And uh, there's a lot of good literature back in the earlier slides that you can rewind and have a look. Uh, welcome to the IBL community. Thanks for listening.